Let's take our Bibles tonight and let's go to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter number 1. And I'll be starting a new series tonight on the verse-by-verse study of the book of Galatians. I've been looking forward to doing this one for about a year and a half. And uh, so uh, the title of the series is No Other Gospel. No Other Gospel. We're going to take our time and go through the book just a little bit at a time. Tonight we're just going to do an introduction. And then next week we'll just start with verse 1 and work our way through. I have no idea how long it'll take. I'm not in a hurry. This is a, it's a great book and uh, one that's, that's vitally important for us. And, you know, it's good for a church to spend some time just studying scriptures verse by verse. I, know I thoroughly enjoyed the, the series going through Hebrews 11. And uh, we, did, we didn't finish that. We stopped it. But uh, there's still more there. I'm still going back and outlining some of that. And we'll probably revisit that a time or two. But uh, the book of Galatians, I've been wanting us to get to that. We'll start in verse number one. We'll read uh, probably the first nine verses we'll start with. Just keep your place here. And, and uh, we may refer to a couple of other scriptures outside of Galatians. But for the most part, we're just going to give some background material and uh, talk a little bit about the book. Galatians chapter one, verse number one. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren which are, were, which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. We could just start shouting after those verses. Amen. Aren't you glad he gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present world. We'll get to it in a later study. But God saved you not just to keep you out of hell. He saved you to keep you away from this world. Yeah. Separation. We're going to get to that in this book. Uh, but that's part of the reason He, he saved us. And so we wouldn't get nasty like the world. We wouldn't get messed up with the, the world. And uh, that's part of the reason He saved us. Amen. Uh, in Psalm it tells us that He is separated us unto himself. He's the one that does the separating. Look at verse number uh, six. I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there's some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. And now let's pray and we'll jump right into the, the, the lesson for tonight. Our Father, as we look at this book, the book of Galatians, and as we begin wading into some doctrines and some, some purposes for this book, would you help us to understand the vital importance of understanding these truths? May we as believers realize that we've got to know your word, we've got to know your, your doctrine, we've got to know the truth so that we can defend the truth in our generation and, and that we would have the opportunity to reach others with the same gospel that saved us. So Father, I pray you'd help us as we study now in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, as we study different books of the Bible, one of the, the first questions that you need to ask when you're looking at a book is to whom was the book written? The person being addressed is, is real important. And, and, and what is the purpose of that book? Those things will help you to understand. Most false doctrine comes because somebody takes a verse out of context and tries to make it say something that it does not say. You can take the Bible and prove anything. You heard about the guy who decided he was going to study the Bible and he said, I'm just going to you know, let the Bible fall up where it would. And, and uh, he, he pointed a finger to a verse and read it. It says that Judas went out and hanged himself. Like, oh man, I don't want to do that. I can find out what I'm supposed to do today. Let it fall open. And then went to another verse. It says, go and do thou likewise. It's like, oh, I am in trouble. I need another verse. <laughs> Third one opened up, put his finger in. What thou doest, do quickly. So with those three verses, I need to go hang myself and do it as fast as I can. Is that what we're supposed to do? No, the Bible doesn't teach that. And so doctrine is really important. And, and the, the verses, you've got to look at them in context. You've got to look at a verse in the context of the whole chapter, the chapter in the context of the book, and the book in the context of the Testament. There are a lot of things in this book that God wrote to Israel that's not to us. It's not for us. Now, there are principles we learn from that. When we see how God dealt with the nation of Israel, we see God's character. 
We see how He does things. And that is just as important as the specific commands He gives us. Because you and I are going to face situations on a daily basis that there's not a verse in the Bible that says, Thou shalt do this or thou shalt not do this. But there are tons of places where God has given us principles. You see how He's acted in similar situations and you get to understand what His mind is about something. And so that's why it's so important to study the Scriptures. As we begin the study of this book, we've got to understand some of the background and the, and the purpose for this book. The first thing we need to understand is who is the author of the book. When I say author, I, don't, I realize every word of this Bible is inspired by God. We do believe in the verbal inspiration of the Scriptures. And, and, and so uh, we understand that and, and, and just lay that as a foundation. God wrote the Bible. There never was a time when there was no Word of God. Psalm 119, verse 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Aren't you glad you have an every word Bible? You can trust it. But we understand the human instrument that God used to put these words on paper was the Apostle Paul. So how do you know that? Verse 1, word 1. Paul, an apostle, not of man, neither by man. Uh, Paul was the one that God used to be the instrument to write it. Uh, I remember John Rice preaching about that one day about verbal inspiration. He said, so what you're trying to say, he said, I don't know what you're thinking. You're thinking that those men were nothing more than secretaries taking dictation. Call it whatever you want, but that's, that's exactly what happened, amen. But it was written, uh, penned by the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Uh, most people believe it was written during his, first, uh, I'm sorry, his second or possibly his third missionary journey. Uh, and it was probably written while he was in Ephesus. Uh, the city of Ephesus was a place that Paul went to very often. And, and uh, Paul had visited the Galatian churches on each of his missionary journeys. Every time he went through that area, uh, he, would, he would stop in those churches. Um, and in this book, when we read the book of Galatians, you do not see him referring to another planned visit. How often do we see that? We talked about the church at Corinth. He wants to see them again. He mentions that in 2 Corinthians. I want to come to see you once again. And, and, and he says that in, in uh, the book of Philippians, that he, he longed to see their face and was planning to come there and, and different ones that, that he wanted to see. But he doesn't say that he's going to do that. Um, and, and most, uh, most of the, the people that I've read after and studying the book of Galatians over the years, most people believe this is the first of the books that the Apostle Paul wrote. That this was the very first epistle, and it is the, the one, probably the only one he wrote with his own hand. Uh, keep your place there in chapter 1, but go to look at chapter number 6 and verse number 11. Galatians 6 and verse 11. I turned to Ephesians 6, 11. That was not the right verse, but this one is. All right. Uh, Galatians 6 and verse 11. See how large a letter uh, I have written unto you with mine own hand. That's interesting that if you compare Scripture with Scripture, it's obvious that Paul had bad eyesight. Uh, one group of believers, the Bible says that they were willing to, uh, to pluck out their own eyes for his sake. They wanted to give him their eyes. What? Uh, that tells you he had bad eyesight <laughs> and couldn't read. Uh, couldn't, couldn't write with a, a small letter. He had to write with a big letter. So no doubt when he wrote this one, he wrote with big letters. You ever notice when you have a last name like Brandenburg, they don't put long enough not lines on forms to put your name? My dad, you, you not believe what he did to my sister, Charlotte Lucille Brandenburg. Why would you do that to your daughter? But dad did. But anyway... Um, you know, Paul writing this, he wrote this with his own hand. So we know that the author, the human author, is the Apostle Paul. Well, that helps you understand a little bit about the book then. Uh, that when, you, when we get into the content, this is a very personal letter. Paul's dealing with things that affected him and affected their, that church. Aren't you glad God's that personal? That he wrote these letters. Of course, we, we know in other places that they're commanded to read the letters. You know, to the church at, uh, at Ephesus, they're supposed to read that letter to the church at Colossae. And they passed those letters around because they were Scripture. Epistles, we call them. And, uh, and, the, and the book of Galatians was written to these believers in Galatia. And, uh, and so, uh, Paul, in writing this, we see that that's, he's the author of the book. Number two, the second thing we want to see is to, to whom was the book written? Well, it was written to the Galatians. Um, when, when you read something in the Scriptures, as I said a, little, a few moments ago, it's important to understand the people being addressed so you understand the context. You know, in Joshua chapter 1, when God says to, 
to Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, rise, go over this Jordan, thou and all these people. To do what? To, to possess the land. And he says to Joshua, every place the sole of your foot have tread upon that have I given unto you. So God makes a promise to Joshua, if you could walk on it, you could have it. Well, I've tried to claim that. I've seen some houses. I'd like to have owned that place. I've walked around them, and I've claimed them. You know what I found out by the rich? God didn't make that promise to me. I drove through some houses today. Man, I was coming back through some gorgeous areas. And uh, I saw a house I'm going to take Rhonda back by to see it because I think it's for sale. Beautiful house. And uh, like, that would be a nice place to live. We just may walk around and claim that. Then maybe get shot at because we're trespassing on their property, you know. But with Joshua, he was commanded to do that. And, and, and he did that. In fact, they, as long as Joshua was alive, they kept conquering new, new land. Well, that was a promise God made to them. That promise wasn't made to us. He didn't tell us every place we walk on we can have. I've walked on a lot of stuff I wish we owned. Amen? Without a, without a payment book. Somebody say amen. But the principle is there. What I promised to you, I will fulfill. That's what he was telling them. And so it is important to understand the book. Now, this book is kind of interesting. When you look at the book of Galatians, uh, it's a little different than some of the other books that the Apostle Paul was used to write. Uh, the other books were written... Uh, first of all, to specific churches. Uh, the, the first and second Corinthians were written to the church at Corinth, Corinth the city of Corinth. Uh, the book of, uh, of Ephesians was written to the church at Ephesus. Uh, the, the, the book of Philippians was written to the church at Philippi. Philippi. That's in West Virginia. Actually, they call it Philippi there, but it's there. Um, by the way, that's where the first battle in the Civil War took place, in Philippi, West Virginia. Um, the book of Colossians was written to the church at Colossae. Uh, the book of, books of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians were written to the, book, the church at Thessalonica. And then uh, the book of Romans uh, was written to believers in Rome. It never says the church in Rome. I don't mess up most of your Catholics. It just mentions the saints. We don't know if Paul ever organized the church. We know there are people there saved. Amen. Even in Caesar's own household, they got saved. Hallelujah for that. Uh, but those were specific groups of people, uh, specific churches. Other books were written to individuals. First and Second Timothy were written to? You're getting an A in this quiz. This is amazing. Uh, the book of Titus, written to? No, written to Bob. No, it's Titus. Um, the book of Philemon, written to? Philemon, about who? Onesimus. Exactly right. And a great, great book. And, uh, and so those were written to specific people. But the book of Galatians is a little different. There's no city of Galatia. It's a province. It's an area. It's like a state. An a it's a landmass about the size of Ohio. It was a large area. And Paul had traveled through that province many, many times. And, and we do know some of the, the cities within that province. And uh, in fact, on some of the missionary journeys, we'll talk about it tonight, uh, where Paul traveled through there. And so this book was written to these groups of churches, there, to the Galatian believers in these. The, and notice in verse number two, unto all, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Uh, that does away with the idea of just one church, that whole universal church. Invisible church. No, churches. Amen? Individual local churches. Uh, and so this is referring to a, 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 a geographical space. Some people believe it might even belong to, uh, might, might also mean to a nationality of people, a particular group of people that lived in an area, um, the Roman province of Galatia, but they were often they were called by that name. Uh, but it's a, these people were connected by where they lived and by what their background was. They were in an area where there was a mixture of different kinds of people. The province, uh, the people for whom the province was named are the Gauls. You've probably heard of them. Uh, it's a Celtic tribe, the same people that live in what is now called France. And so we're talking about that group of people in the 4th century B.C. They had invaded the Roman Empire, later crossed over Greece uh, uh, and, and so forth uh, in, in 280 B.C. Uh, and uh, if you study through them, they were a warlike people. Uh, they were always on the move. They never stayed where they were. They just kept moving, going from place to place, conquering different places. And uh, when they moved into Asia Minor, they found they liked it, so they stayed. And uh, they became subjects of the Roman Empire. And uh, in fact, one, one group of, I don't know how you prove this because there were no cameras. They said they were blonde Orientals. 
I read that in one of the books. I was like, really? Did you see a picture on their Facebook page? How do you know that? But uh, this group of people, was, was uh, uh, they, they were reached by the Apostle Paul beginning with his very first missionary journey. So he, he went out the very first time when it was Barnabas and Saul. They traveled into this area. It's interesting, some things about them. The Galatians were very much like uh, the people of America who came from England or from Europe. Uh, Caesar said this about them. The infirmity of the Gauls is that they are fickle in their resolves. They are fond of change and not to be trusted. I had some faces just kind of cross my eyes when I thought of that. Not anybody I'm looking at right now. I just thought of some people, you know. Uh, but isn't that very much like America? We love change. You ever notice that? You, you buy something new and six months later you've got to have another new one. I mean like you get a new car but they, as soon as you buy it they come out with a new model. But I want that one. Why are you smacking your husband? Well, he did that when you bought your Hyundai. He had that, what, how many days? <coughs> was it six months? Was it that long? He bought the, uh, did you buy the Elantra and then trade in for the Sonata, right? I remember that. Then it had been a while I'd forgotten about that for, now that you mentioned that. Yeah. He went to get the oil changed or something, came back with a new car <laughs> and a new payment book. <laughs> but isn't it funny? You know, you go, out and you, 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 you go buy one of the new New smartphones. I'm not sure if those two words should be in the same sentence. <laughs> you get one, and as soon as you get home, it's outdated. They got another new one, especially if it's a Samsung, because they release an, you know, a new model like every day. And uh, you buy a new computer, you get it home, barely get it, in, get it up and running. And you got every, all the updates running from Windows that takes you know, 14 days, 6 hours, and 12 minutes to finally get all the updates done. And then you find out it's outdated. And uh, we, we like new stuff all the time. Uh, the, the, the Gauls, they, uh, they, they were people, the, the, the Galatian people, they always liked change. They always wanted something new. They were looking for something different than what they had. That's a spiritual problem. It's covetousness is what it is. An amazing old things that we, we have to have because we saw an advertisement that if we hadn't seen the advertisement, we wouldn't know it existed and wouldn't know we even wanted one, let alone think we had to have one. Well, I was somewhere the other day and somebody asked, what did we do before we had cell phones? We talked to people face to face. We, had, we used words to communicate with people. We didn't use emojis. Did you see they, somebody has perverted the scriptures come out with an emoji King James Bible? I just read that today. Like, really? We like change. But in America, that's exactly the way we are. You know, these people, we see them illustrated here in the Scriptures. Keep your place in Galatians, but let's go to Acts chapter 14. And it's important to understand this background. Once we get into the doctrines, you'll see why their, their background, their character training affects what they do for God. I've seen so many people that got saved, but they didn't have good character or they had major character flaws that prevented them from being what they should be for God. And uh, that's why it's important to reach children with the gospel while they're young. Amen. Uh, look there in Acts chapter number 14. Um, and we'll start in verse number 6. Uh, where, this is uh, Paul out on the missionary journey there. And it says, And they were aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconia, into the region that lieth round about. And there they preached the gospel. Hallelujah for that. And there sat a certain man at Lystra. And of course, Lystra is in that province, what we would consider Galatia. Impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. When the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speeches of Laconia, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. So picture this. Here's Paul and Barnabas, as we see him mentioned there in verse number 12. And they heal this man, and people say, look, the gods have come. Verse number 12, and they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before the people, uh, brought oxen and garlands into the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people. You understand what's going on? 
They saw Paul and Barnabas heal this man. And, and now they begin to worship Paul and Barnabas as though they were gods. The priests of that false god bring some animals. They're going to have a sacrifice. Verse number 14, which uh, when the apostles, Barnabas and, and Paul, heard of it, they rent their clothes and ran among the people crying out, saying, Sirs, why do you these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God which made heaven and earth and the sea and all that... Uh, are, in, are therein, who in times past, I'm sorry, yeah, in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. N uh, nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these things uh, scarce restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. And, uh, and we see later on in verse number 19, And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, having stoned Paul and drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. So in one verse, you got him wanting to make him a god. And they're, they're going to worship to him. And then he says, No, I'm not a god. I'm preaching to you about the real god. Now they want to stone him to death. That's how fickle these people were. Kind of reminds me of Americans. You know, you choose a guy, you'll vote for a guy to be president, and then, you know, three weeks after you voted for him, you want to stone him. Isn't that the way we are? That's the, the mentality of the people that, that we're dealing with here. That's their, just kind of how they are. Let's go back to the book of Galatians. These people in Galatia had every kind of doctrine being preached unto them. They had many different cults and false doctrine that were in their society. Well, that's the way we are today. You know, they, they like to call that pluralism. And uh, like, well, we've got to be accepting of all of that. No, we've got to preach the truth. Yeah, right. Amen? Yeah. We live in a society that, that there's a lot of pressure to just back off on what we believe. As we go through this, this chapter and, and, and we see uh, the writer of the book is Paul and to those to whom it was written, of course, is the, uh, the Galatians. But the purpose of the writing we see in verse number 6. Look at it there. Galatians 1 and verse number 6, the purpose of the writing of the book, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. The purpose of the writing of this book is found in these few verses. Some men that we call the Judaizers had come uh, they had followed the Apostle Paul. They had a habit of going from place to place behind him and preaching and changing what his doctrine was. They would, they would go to these different churches and they would cause problems to the churches. In fact, there it says, verse number 7, that they would trouble. Some would trouble you and do what? Pervert the gospel. They'd mess it up. Uh, they would change the gospel. They made it their business to visit and to unsettle and trouble Gentile churches. It's amazing, a church I pastored years ago, uh, we, had, we had a man in our church that caused a lot of problems. And uh, this man, I could never get him to go soul winning. We started seeing people saved, started seeing new people come, and this guy had always had power in the church. He'd run things behind the scene with his money. And, uh, and, and he decided he, he didn't like what was going on. He was, people getting saved, the church had more than doubled in size, and, and uh, he was losing his grip, he thought. I started noticing some people leaving. I found out what he was doing. Brother, he was actually going every Monday night to visit the visitors who came on Sunday to tell them not to come back. That's wicked. It's satanic. It's exactly what it is. So don't be surprised when that kind of thing happens. That's what happened to the Apostle Paul. I and mean, they were troubling these churches. And, uh, and, and they, were, they were stirring up some things. By the way, God takes it very seriously when you mess with His churches. And when you, when you sow discord among brethren. Uh, like this problem here in Galatia became so strong that you have, a, you have a, a council that was made in Acts 15 where they came together to ask the questions that were raised because of these false teachers. And God took the time to write some, uh, a book in the Bible about it. Uh, you know, God hates it when there's division. Uh, Proverbs chapter 6. Just, we'll turn there. Proverbs 6. Let's turn there. Keep your place in, in uh, Proverbs. We will come right back. Just read a few verses. These are good ones to mark in your Bible if you mark, if you underline. And in uh, Proverbs chapter number 6, and we'll begin at verse 16. 
These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that, are, that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. God says, I hate that. That's exactly what was going on in Galatians. Uh, in these prov- the province of Galatia, in these churches. What was going on is these, these believers, these Judaizers, they had come to the churches that Paul had started. I mean, think about it. These are pl- people that Paul had won to Christ. Paul and, 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 and of course, Barnabas was with him and, and, uh, and the others. And, of course, John Mark was there for part of the trip. And as they were going through these churches and preaching and winning folks to Christ, establishing the churches, these people would come right behind them. And, uh, and they began to attack the Apostle Paul. Uh, and so God includes the book of Galatians in our Bible to address the, the problems caused by these people. For two things, the method of their attack is in twofold. First of all, they attacked the Apostle Paul's message. We read it there in verse number 6 where, where the Bible says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from... From him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Look at verse 8. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. That literally means let him be cut off and sent to hell. Let me just, and we'll get to this in another study. We get into that part of it very very carefully. Verse number 9, as we said before, so so I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. That means if somebody preaches that baptism saves you, the Bible says let him go to hell. That's a devilish doctrine. If taking Lord's Supper would give you salvation, let him go to hell. That's a false doctrine. So I don't know that I like that. That's what God said. There is no other gospel. And Paul's very very clear about that. They had attacked Paul's message. Uh, they were teaching that the, that the gospel, uh, they were teaching a gospel that was contrary to what Paul had preached. And we'll look at this in great detail as we go through the, the next chapters, but we'll see a couple verses here. Uh, just, in fact, let's look at Galatians chapter 5. Just turn over there, if you will, Galatians 5. Again, we're just laying foundation for our study. Galatians 5, verse number 2. Uh, Let's back up to verse 1. I don't want to miss that one. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Go to chapter 6 and verse number 12. He says, as many as, uh, I'm sorry, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh... They constrain you to be circumcised only lest, uh, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Neither, uh, for, they, uh, for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire, you to, uh, desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. Here's what they were doing. They were adding the works of the Jewish law to faith for people to be saved. Here's what they were doing. They would come to the churches where Paul was preaching. He said, Paul told you about Christ. Yeah. He told you about that Jesus died for your sins. He did. He told you that he was buried. Yeah. And then he rose again. And you're to put your faith in him. Yeah, that's exactly what he preached. Man, that's wonderful. But he didn't tell you anything, everything. There's more to it than that. You need to, you need to add to that keeping the law. Because you're a Gentile and we're Jews and we know more than you do. So you need to keep the law. That's what the Seventh-day Adventists are teaching. That's what the Mormons teach. Well, he gave another book. There's another testament of Jesus Christ. That's what the Mormons teach. You say, Pastor, I just don't think you ought to mention them. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to name false doctrine. The Catholics teach you come and pay your money and light a candle. That's going to get you to heaven. No, that's adding to the, the work of Christ. If I could get saved by doing anything, then Jesus didn't need to come. And so Paul is, is defending his gospel. We'll get to that in great detail in the lessons. But they were attacking his message. By the way, this is not the only time that happens. Go to Acts chapter 16. This seems to be a pattern in the ministry of Paul 
that, that Satan attacked his preaching. In Acts chapter 16, of course, this is the, the famous story of, of uh, Paul and Silas in jail. Uh, we see it in the first part of the chapter um, where they, uh, you know, Paul sets out on that second missionary journey. You see him leaving in, in the end of chapter 15. And beginning of chapter 16, he gets uh, Timothy to go with him and begins traveling with him. And, and they get to Philippi. Now, if you will, look all the way down to verse number 16. Acts chapter 16, verse number 16. It came to pass as we went to prayer. A certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. I'm going to pause right there. You understand who this woman is? She's demon possessed, and she told fortunes, charged money for it, and the people that owned her, she's technically a slave to them, made a lot of money. You know why the liquor crowd gets mad when we preach against booze? Because it's going to affect their pocketbook. That's why they get mad. I mean, when you start attacking that kind of stuff. And so that's kind of the setting uh, that um, uh, she brought them much, uh, much gain, much money. They, she made them a lot of money. Verse 17, the same followed Paul and us and cried. Of course, we know that's, you know, including that's Luke because he's part of the us. He's the one writing that. And cried saying, these men are the servants of the most high God, which show unto us the way of salvation. So here's this woman, she's demon-possessed, she's telling fortunes, making money for these guys that own her, and she's saying, well, these are the prophets of the, of the true God. They're the, uh, these are the servants of the Most High God. And that sounds good, but look at verse number 18. And this she did many days, but Paul was grieved and turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee by the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and he came out the same hour. She wasn't going around testifying for them, she was mocking them. She was known as the soothsayer. She's the one that answered what's going to happen tomorrow. You went to her to get your lottery number. Both are just as wicked. Yeah. And so she was mocking them. What are they doing? Attacking their preaching. That's what Paul did. Paul turned around and cast the demon out. She got saved. That's why Paul and Silas got arrested. Look at it again as we, as we continue on. Uh, it says in verse number 18, And this she did many days, but Paul being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers. Why are they mad? Because they just lost a bunch of money. They brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe them, being Romans. You see, let me just make this statement. Real believers bother lost people. If wicked people who live in the world, in the lifestyle uh, uh, that's, that's promoted by Satan... If they're comfortable around you, you have a problem with your spirituality. You see, when these men began to preach the truth and it started changing lives, the people that gained money by that wickedness were bothered by it. They arrested them. They ended up in prison. And it says in verse number um, 22, And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrate ran off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into the prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. That's how they got into prison that day. Let's go to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. We'll see another example of this. 2 Timothy chapter 4. They're attacking Paul's message, his preaching. 2 Timothy 4, and look at verse number 14. Well, the Bible says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Now, that word evil means to do wrong with the intent to harm. When you do evil, you do something that's wrong, but you do it in a way to hurt somebody. When you're getting back at somebody and you do something to make sure they suffer, you're evil. That's the Bible word for it. It says, this man, he... Uh, he had done me much evil. And then notice what Paul says. The Lord reward him according to his works. We'd word it this way. Get him, God. Another place we won't look at it tonight. Uh, but the Bible says they turned 
Alexander and Hymenaeus over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. God kill them. Why? Because they dared mess with the preaching of the man of God. That's what we find in the next verse. In, uh, look in verse number um, 15. Of whom be thou where also? So here's, here's Paul telling this young pastor, Timothy, watch him. Why? For he hath greatly withstood our, what's the word? Words. He didn't like the preaching of Paul. So it seems to be a pattern in the scriptures that over and over again, when Paul was attacked, they attacked his message. You know, we have a similar problem today where people don't want to hear the clear message of the Bible. You listen to almost all the junk on television that's considered to be religious programming, you know, Christian TV. That stuff's not going to preach against your sin. It's going to tell you you're going to have your best days now, your best life now. And, you know, everything's good. I remember the old, the old Crystal Cathedral, you know, with Robert Schuller was something good is going to happen to you. Not if you don't get saved, it's not. You're going to bust hell wide open, fry like sausage, like the southern preacher said. Amen. You're, you're saved and you don't live for God. Something good's not going to happen to you. God's going to take you to the woodshed. You know, so we've got to understand that, that this generation doesn't like that kind of preaching and it shouldn't surprise us it was that way in the Bible days. We have a generation who would rather hear a message that makes them feel good than to understand the truth. I am, I am really, really concerned by, I'm not, I'm not talking about people in our church, but I hear it around the country and people I talk to and you see stuff on, 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 uh, on social media where people, all they want in church is, how much fun can we have? Did you have fun at church? Well, when I had my knee surgery to fix a problem in my knee, it wasn't fun. There was nothing I enjoyed about that. In fact, that was a horrible situation. It was just before Haley was born. Rhonda drives me to the surgery center. I go in there and, you know, she's with me as they, you know, put me in all the... the, the oh, I'm glad we didn't have phones with cameras in them back in those days because I had my little yellow poofy little thing on my head. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, man. I was adorable in it. But anyway, they, uh, I'm in that thing, and you know, they, they write on which knee you're going to operate on. That's an important thing. They make you X on it. Like, yeah, this one. This one? No, this one. I go in, I'm in surgery. And when I come out, Rhonda's not there. She's on a plane flying to Chicago because Haley's about to get born. There was Jim Holder. Jim Holder is 81 years old. He was assistant pastor of Lighthouse Baptist Church. That's who I woke up to. <laughs> like, where's Rhonda? She had to leave. She had to get to the airport. Said there's a baby coming. What? You see where I rank on this scale? Not very high. She was the first. Same one. I, I, I had my Blackberry in those days. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send out a text to everybody that I'm in recovery. I typed, I'm in discovery. <laughs> There's Victor Marshall, my good buddy, text me back. He said, they must have given you the good stuff. <laughs> but yeah, need some more of that. But that knee surgery was not fun. Coming to church, we don't come for fun. This is not an entertainment venue. Right. That's why it doesn't look like a nightclub. That's why we don't have, a, you know, have it set up like a stage. This is a platform for preaching. This is a worship center. I don't have a problem with that word. We come here to worship Him. I don't mind the word sanctuary. Why? Because this building, this room is set apart. It's sanctified for what? The preaching of the gospel. Amen? And so, you know, we've got to understand that we live in a generation that mo most churches today, they're, they call themselves churches, they're really religious country clubs. And they're trying to find a place where everybody can feel good about themselves. They did their religious duty. That's not why we come to church. We come so God can take His book and cut into us and fix what is wrong. Amen. We don't like that. Go to, you're there in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Go to, look at verse number 1. Paul says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing in His kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. Notice that's a choice. They turned. I'm amazed how many people grew up in good churches. They know the truth. 
but they've left to go to either no church or they go to the one where nobody's preaching anything. Where you can go and act just like you do on Friday night at the bar, act like that at church and nobody notices anything. The music's the same. The dress is the same. Amen. You got the, 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 the praise band on the platform looks just like the, the, the boy band playing down at the nightclub with the spiky hair and the skinny jeans. Now, I want, when you walk in here, I want you to know you're at church. That's why we use hymnals. That's why we carry Bibles. Amen. It was the same problem in, in Jehoshaphat's day when Jehoshaphat was king. He was looking for somebody to come give him some counsel. It says in 1 Kings 22, verse number 7, and Jehoshaphat said, Is there not a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of, uh, of him? She said, Hey, we need a prophet of God to give us some counsel. Notice what the, the, they said. Um, the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micaiah, uh, Micaiah the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. For he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Joshua Josh said, let not the king say so. So, okay, we're not going here. What do I mean? He didn't like the preaching. So we're not going to call him because I know what he's going to say. He's going to say evil against them because they were evil. Amen. You know, that's why Jude, in fact, let's turn there. Jude, the little book of Jude, just for the revelation. Jude, verse number 3. This is one of those verses every believer ought to know. Jude, just one chapter, verse number 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. As believers, we need to earnestly contend for the faith. You see, in Paul's day, in the book of Galatians, we see the book is written. One of the main reasons, number one, they were attacking his message. But number two, if you go back to Galatians chapter one, they were attacking his apostleship, his call, his authority as a man of God. Notice what he says in verse number one. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Uh, he goes on down to, uh, let's see here, we'll jump down to verse number 10. For do I now persuade men or God? Uh, he, he says, uh, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. It means he didn't get it from some man. For neither I received it of man, neither was I taught it, uh, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above uh, mine equals in mine own nation, being more exceeding je uh, zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Now notice what he's saying. Realize the context. You had people that were strong Jews coming teaching Gentiles. They had to obey Jewish law. And Paul stands up and says, You know me before I got saved. I was the example of the Jewish religion. He was the Jew's Jew. Who better to speak on this from a human perspective than a man who had spent his entire life learning to be a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, trained at the feet of Gamaliel, the number one teacher in the world. He had the credentials. But notice what he said in verse number 15. But it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace to reveal His Son in me that I might preach among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither when I uh, went up to Jerusalem to, with, which the, uh, which, uh, to them which were apostles before me. But I went to Arabia and returned again into Damascus. And there after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. Here's what he's saying. He's saying that uh, they were attacking his apostles who he was. They were saying he didn't have the right message. He said, wait a minute. My message came directly from Jesus Christ. He's the one who called me. We'll look at, at that in much greater detail. Uh, but it is amazing how that Satan always wants to attack what is genuine from God. Mm -hmm. Satan always has a counterfeit. Yeah. Right. You know, Paul did come out of, out of Judaism. He was a Jew and got saved. By the way, you know Jesus was a Jew. It's been said that Judaism was the cradle of Christianity and very nearly its grave. And we'll see in our study as we look at 
uh, into some, some, some additional things about the book of Galatians. Let me just give you a couple thoughts about it and we'll move on. Uh, and we're just about out of time tonight. Uh, the book of, Ro- uh, of Galatians is comparable to the book of Romans. There are 19 passages, and we'll look at them, that go together, Romans and Galatians. Um, what, what, one fellow worded it this way, Galatians is the rough sketch of what Romans is the finished picture. The doctrines we see in Galatians are preached in the book of, uh, of Romans and give us great doctrine. And so as we study through the book, we'll see a lot of great doctrines of the Scriptures. Its theme, uh, we'll just go through some verses. Go to uh, Galatians chapter 3 and look at verse number 11. Galatians 3 and verse 11. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. Look at verse number 22. But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Chapter 3, verse number 24. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Look at verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Look at chapter 5 and verse number 5. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. The theme of the book of Galatians is justification by faith. Salvation by faith. What was being attacked? They were saying you had to add works to that. So the theme is justification by faith. The key word, uh, you'll see it in chapter 2. Go back there. Galatians 2 and verse number 4. That because... uh, of false brethren unawares brought in who came in privately to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage. Notice the word liberty. Go to chapter 5 and verse number 1. Read this one a moment ago. Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Uh, Chapter 5 and verse number 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. I'm just going to pause right there. We have a lot of people preaching that today, using the word grace. And by that, they mean live any way you want to. There's no limit. That's not what that means. Look at what it says for verse uh, 13 of chapter 5. For brethren, you've been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Let me just say this. We'll come back to another lesson. There still are absolutes in the Bible. There are things that are wrong. There are things that are right. Contrary to what this world wants you to believe. And what some churches are preaching today. Liberty is the key word. Uh, It's been said that the the book of Galatians is, is Paul's fighting epistle. You see, when these Judaizers attack the gospel... The gospel of grace, the justification by faith. Do you understand that everything was in danger? Because if you take away salvation by faith, everything we believe goes out the window. Everything. And so that's why uh, the Bible is so clear in this. That's why God gave Paul such strong language. Because this is the very foundation of everything we believe. And you attack salvation by faith and by grace, then every other doctrine falls apart. When you look back and go to Galatians chapter 1, we'll, we'll read this and, and, uh, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, Galatians 1, we read these a couple times. Verse number 6, I marvel that you're so soon removed from Him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there's some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. It's interesting when you get to the book of Galatians all the other books that Paul wrote, he commends people. He talks about the things they're doing well and then he gives them some admonition. He prays for them. He talks, I'm I'm thankful for every remembrance of you but there's none of that in Galatians 1. There is no saying I joy in you. There's no commending them. No patting them on the back saying you're doing well. He starts off ripping their faces off. Why? Because the very foundation of the faith has been attacked. It's a very stern letter. Uh, it's one, one fellow worded it this way. It's the Apostle Paul with his war paint on. I like the attitude. Uh, you see, Paul had no toleration for legalism. 
Let me give you a definition. We as independent Baptists who preach separation, meaning we're not supposed to look like the world, we're not to dress like the world, sound like the world, use the world's music, we're called legalists. We're not. Legalists add the law to faith for salvation. That's a legalist. When you say you've got to be baptized to be saved, you're a legalist. When you say you have to take communion to get saved, you're a legalist. Well, you've got to join the church to be saved, you're a legalist. You've got to pray to Mary to get saved, you're a legalist. Not when you say women ought not wear pants, men ought to get a haircut, we ought not listen to rock music. That's not being a legalist, that's being a separatist. Big difference. Legalism is not preaching standards or separation. Legalism is adding to the works, adding the works of the law to faith in Christ. It's been said Romans came from Paul's head, Galatians came from his heart. Now we know it both came from God, but I like the idea. Galatians takes up controversially what Romans puts down systematically. One fellow worded it this way, it is the declaration of emancipation from legalism. It was Martin Luther's favorite book. He said, this is my epistle, I am wedded to it. It was the main book of the, of the Reformation. It was called the Magna Carta of the early church. It is the manifesto of Christian liberty. Um, it's interesting that the book of Galatians is what moved John Wesley. He came to America as a missionary to the Indians. He graduated from college and come to America as a missionary and he found out he was not saved. He said, I came to preach to the Indians who will preach to John Wesley. And in reading the book of Galatians, he came to know the Lord Jesus. He went back to England and, and uh, then came, began to preach great revivals. Many of those great sermons were from the book of Galatians. If you study history, you study great revivals from the Great Awakening. and you, I mean, go clear back to, to Wesley. Those men... Uh, many of the great revivals started with preaching out of the book of Galatians. You see, this book teaches us, not only does a sinner get saved by grace through faith plus nothing, but the saved sinner is to live by that grace that he got when he got saved. Grace is the way to life, and grace is the way of life. As we study the, this series, No Other Gospel, we'll find out that, that what saved us is what will keep us day by day walking with God. Let's pray. Our Father, I thank you for the, the Bible. Thank you that you've given us very, very clear doctrine. May we as believers determine we're going to know the truth and we're going to be able to defend the truth. Help us not to be swayed by the the. the the preaching and the influences of those around us who have turned away from the Scriptures. May we not listen to their voices. May we stay in the Scriptures. May we not be pulled aside by a society and a culture that teaches us anything goes. May we understand that you've got some absolutes and there is one way to heaven and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ and there's one way we're to live while we're on our way to heaven and that's in His grace. I pray you'd help us to so live that others around us would know that we're a believer, that we can introduce them to the one who can wash their sins away and give them a home in heaven. Bless us, I pray, as we're dismissed tonight. Would you help us as we gather back for Saturday for soul winning and then this Sunday, would you use us this week to make a difference in the lives of people. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.